So welcome everyone to another edition of uh, the ongoing, our ongoing series on Bayesian machine learning at scale. Uh, so a quick announcement before we get to the talk today. Uh, so registration should open soon for Andrew Gelman's talk on August 26th. So be sure to keep an eye out for the registration link on our website, which should be posted soon. Uh, so today we've got Cheng Sang from uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge in the UK. So we're pleased to have her here today. She's a senior researcher at the All Data AI Group at MSR Cambridge. And she is currently leading a project, uh, Project Azua on data efficient decision making. And her research interests include machine learning theory, uh, Bayesian deep learning, approximate inference causality, Bayesian experimental design, and reinforcement learning for sequential decision making. Also including uh, various machine learning applications with uh, business and social impact. And today she's gonna to be presenting her work on efficient element-wise information acquisition with Bayesian experimental design. So before her talk gets started, just be sure uh, to enter your questions when you've got them in the Q&A box. And we'll take a few short questions during the talk, uh, during some brief intermissions, and then we'll have a 15 minute uh, time at the end for more detailed questions. So Cheng, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation. Today I'll talk about element-wise uh, active information acquisition with Bayesian deep latent Gaussian model. So it's a long title, but uh, I promise I'll touch every single word in this talk. So first, uh, uh, I will thank my collaborators. So I'll talk about three pieces of work in, collab uh, in collaboration with Chalma, Zembo, uh, Miguel, Sebastian uh, Nolzin, Sebastian Triatek, uh, Konstantina, and Rich. So Chow and Wenbo were my interns uh, in Microsoft Research. Uh, Miguel and Rich are visiting researchers in Microsoft Research, and uh, this work is also in collaboration with other colleagues in Microsoft Research. Uh, as Mike uh, introduced, I'm currently leading the Project Azure Data Efficient Decision Making. So today I'm just talking about a small subset of our research in the Project Azure. So if you're interested, feel free to check out our project. We'll keep our project updated and you can see all the publication we have there. So let's start. Uh, obtaining information is really costly, so the data are not free. And think about the interview, uh, recruiters need to ask you questions and then as candidates need time to answer them and time is money. And think about in healthcare setting, uh, where each feature where when we think about it is actually a medical test. It can be invasive, it, like for example, take blood samples or even more invasive sometimes. So, and also in natural science. So obtaining information is costly in terms of money, risk, and time, et cetera. And let's look at Alice and Bob. So let's think about which solution do you like? So if Alice is coughing and Bob likes, okay, for you, have you uh, uh, measure your temperature? You seem to have a cold. Alice takes the temperature and tell Bob, and Bob thinks, oh, this is really a bad situation, let's go to the hospital. And alternatively is you can input a long vector of all different features, including temperature, age, height, and everything with Alice uh, to AI. The system probably will come up with the same conclusion. So which way do you like? So I think it's obvious that we will prefer the, the way in the left than the solution on the right, because as human, we really want to make a high quality decision uh, in the efficient manner, and also we can act fast and we don't need to collect all the information that are really not relevant because we can know condition what we know, we uh, access the information in the way we desired for the decision making. So the overview of the project can be uh, formulated in this way. So we have any decision. Let's just think about a Chloe uh, in a, a setting of diagnosis. And Probably in the beginning, we don't have any information on Chloe, and there are diagnoses of different diseases, and we're very uncertain. And what we want is, based on our experience, probably the first question we're going to ask is temperature. And then with this information, we can update our diagnosis, and we can also update our belief about how much information does other type of feature can contribute to our decision. And we can do next step, uh, we can ask whether Chloe have a cough because when you have high temperature, I think we need to uh, to ask whether coughing is uh, something Chloe is experiencing, and then we can update 
the diagnostic decision and we get more confident. And I think when the diagnostic decision is confident enough, we can stop asking questions, we can stop the information acquisition process uh, and then make our decision. So this is a uh, time saving and it also ensures that we can make decision in time so that we can carry out the treatment with Chloe in time. So the same actually can apply to many other settings. We talk about healthcare. It's the same for survey. Like you must have filled some questionnaire before. I mean, your if sent out questionnaire, I think everyone filled before. So the questionnaire can be really long. We can make dynamic questionnaire. Maybe for our decision, we don't need all the questions. And there are really long survey, for example, the National Health Care Survey from the US is actually have more than 700 questions. The same for recommender system. What do we ask user when there is a new user uh, registered to a system is the same for online education. We want to personalize the quizzes and exercise for the kids to, to um, study. The same for insurance, uh, machine maintenance, energy, etc. So there are many application area where information are costly and we probably want efficient information acquisition to make our decisions. Okay, now let's see how we can use machine learning to reduce the information cost while retaining decision quality. And let's go back to the beginning, like where Alice and the Bob uh, example. So when Bob see Alice copying, what's in Bob's mind? So first, when Bob observe uh, Alice is copying, Bob probably think Alice have cold. It's uncertain, but yeah, very likely. Whether Alice have fever or not, not sure. There are many other things Bob can estimate. For example, Alice probably don't have malaria. So that's first. Bob can estimate based on what he see from Alice. What's the situation of everything he actually don't know yet in a probabilistic manner. Uh, and secondly, is what I see the, the red box. So based on this estimation, Bob can decide in this situation to best take care of Alice, which information should I acquire? Like in terms of which question should I ask? Then in this case, Bob asked Alice to measure the temperature. So the step one uh, for, I mean, for the pool project, we want to behave really like a Bob. So then we do the step one is uh, missing value prediction because Bob is estimating what is unknown yet based on what is known. So the first contribution of this project is we want to estimate the uh, information that we don't know in a with uncertainty estimation. And the second is the element wise information acquisition. So this is the step to choose which is the best question to ask. So this work I'm going to talk about is uh, called ID efficient dynamic uh, uh, discovery of high value information with partial VAE. So this work is published last year in ICML. So just a very a quick recap, I think many audience probably know, uh, the deep generative model, uh, in particular variation of autoencoder. So this is a very successful model in machine learning. It bridged the gap of deep learning and probabilistic modeling, and it takes advantage of both sides. And the model is very simple. It's a very basic latent rival model factorized in this way. So you can think about the V is latent rival, and then the X is generated from Z. And we use actually quite standard variational inference method to infer it. So we assume there is a simple distribution, which is Q, and then we want to bring the Q and the P together by minimizing the KL divergence, and then we translate it into maximize. Uh, evidence lower bound, which we have elbow uh, in the form on the right. So what is different from traditional probability modeling, so all these procedure like steps with a P, with a Q, with elbow is very, very standard for probability modeling and the variational inference. What's uh, cool about variational autoencoder is all these are neural network. So how to generate X from the latent variable Z is the deep neural network. It's very flexible and uh, the same applies the hourly round instead of estimating every single Z with a separate distribution, which is costly because we have the box, which means many data points. We actually use the neural network to estimate the latent variable Z for each uh, input X. And in this way, it actually gave us a encoder and decoder uh, architecture, and we can use standard deep learning technique to alert all these networks. Uh, so I gave the example here, so you can encode the DAC and decode the, the same DAC. It's a probabilistic model, so it actually 
gave us uncertainty. So a typical Z is a Gaussian distributed. Okay, so what's the challenge here? Think about we actually need to do the first step in Bob, but the standard version of the encoder cannot handle partial population because in the healthcare setting, every different patient may have all different uh, medical tests associated with them. Like patient one may have variable A, C, B, and E measured, and patient two may have A and B. And the same for the duck. It's like uh, it's if you observe some information, it's never complete. And the original of the encoder currently, also it's very successful, but it cannot handle such partial observation. So to address it, what do we need to do? Is we just want to change the variation autoencoder to partial variation autoencoder so that the goal is we can infer the missing value in a probabilistic manner, in a scalable manner from the observed value XO. So how do we do it? Let's look at the model because it's uh, uh, factorized in this particular way, if we actually know the latent variable z, we can sample x, right? So the x is fully factorized. And so in this way, we can write our evidence lower bound, which is uh, the loss for the optimization. And you can see the left side is standard version autoencoder, and the right side is partial version autoencoder. So the bounds still hold. Everything can be right in the, exactly the same way, just instead of taking the fully observed x, the current bound is XO, which means only the observed part of the whole vector. For example, the, the test A and B, which are the only tests observed in the Bob and Alice case, the XO will be coughing, uh, which is observed, and then temperature, and et cetera, are not observed. So the bounds still hold. So the challenge now is, how do we actually design the, the Q Z given XO? Because it's the inference net, and we need this autoencoder decoder structure. Okay, let's recall what the observation looks like. So every single uh, data in this way, there are a set. It can be of all different sizes. Uh, it can be of all different order, and they don't need necessarily overlap for, for all different patients, right? So what we borrowed is we borrowed the idea from actually computer vision, from point net. And Instead of a standard encoder, we actually use a point net architecture for the encoder structure. The key is we use a symmetric op operator, uh, which uh, it can be like example, like a summation uh, or max pooling, right? Because uh, with such an operator, uh, you can have the input of arbitrary lens, it always gives you a fixed as the uh, vector afterwards. So to make the network flexible, commonly the input need to be embedded in a certain space. So we embed it in the network with a net shared network H. And then the input, we also not only like, for example, the temperature, the, the value of the temperature, but we also know which feature is which. So we also need to know the identity embedding of each feature. This can be learned or be set uh, in priori. So in computer vision, this can be set as just as 3D coordinates in the really point cloud setting. But here we do learn a feature embedding, like the identity embedding. So we know, okay, this is the first feature, this is the second feature. So in this way, we can have uh, partial observation as input and with embedding to tell you which feature is which, and then output a fixed size vector. This is our encoder. And with a fixed size vector, we can uh, form other transformation to get our code Z. We can decode in the same way as before. So in this particular setting, uh, and what's most a standard way is we concatenate the value of X and the identity embedding of the feature E together as the input of S. Uh, but for the S, we can take all different forms. So in computer vision, in point net, it is concatenation. Uh, we also think that uh, we, uh, we can use multiplication. So in this way, we can also generalize it to zero imputing based method because for zero imputing based method is, okay, one, we have the set input for all the input we didn't observe, we just put zero. So this can be one of our baseline. But for this, if we actually, instead of using concatenation, we use multiplication, then we actually can generalize uh, the zero imputing based method. Okay. So this is the partial VAE method. So we can think in this way. This is a picture of the encoder decoder network. And instead of a regular encoder, we actually use a point net structure of the encoder. And in this way, we can 
input partial observation, and then we can output uh, like a, to example uh, the observation that was not there. So we can impute the missing value, and it's a version of autoencoder, so it's in the probabilistic manner. So the whole pipeline is summarized here. So the encoder is a set encoder. The decoder is standard decoder, or we call it generator. Any standard architecture, we can use it. The loss is the partial elbow we talked about. So uh, we only use the loss when its uh, observation is there. Let's look at some examples. So if we have this partial AE, uh, as we think about the Bob analysis case, that's the step one, right? Look at the coffee and then to predict what is unknown. Uh, as standard machine learning, let's evaluate also on some standard machine learning task. So when we think about missing value imputation, the first thing coming in mind is we can do image in painting. And then let's just do uh, image in painting. So the plot A in the uh, far left, you sh we show the input uh, of the network. And then, we then with this input, we can sample different imputed image, right? And then we compare the baseline of this zero imputing. ZIM means zero imputing with mask. So not only input uh, the imputed vector with zero, we also indicate which is mask because then the network can know whether it's missing or it's a black pixel. And the PN and PNP are our point net based approach. One is uh, PN is the one with concatenation of the embedding and the value. The PNP is a multiplication based one. So the far right to uh, imputation results using our method. So we can see that with such an input, our method can actually better have captures uncertainty because with the i, then we can see it's collapsed to all zero. With just this little input, it can be anything. You can see with our method, we can sample like a three or six or zero or eight from this input as well. And of course, this is one example. We did report like more statistically significant results. Uh, so we tested in two ways. One is we random remove pixels uh, and try to impute it. Another way is we remove exactly like what I showed the example here is the region of the image being removed and try to impute it. And we compare the evidence lower bound. So the higher, the better. Uh, the way you full means if the full observation. So it it's kind of a reference. It's not the same input for the later four column as a method. So you can see that our method does give improved performance on this simple imaging painting task. OK, when we think about uh, missing value prediction, another thing easily come to mind is recommender system. Because in recommender system, one formulation is we can think it as a matrix. And each row is a user, each column is an item. And we observe some rating, and there's a lot more that are not observed. So we can predict them and see whether we can find the correct user prefer preference. Then we can do the user recommendation. We tested with a very standard benchmark data set. It's a move length 1 million. So we can see that our method does perform better than the state of our method because we actually compute uh, with all like a different recommender system before 2019. Uh, this is a simple uh, task for the missing value imputation. So you can see that we finished the step one, uh, is we introduce a partial AE so that we can do missing value prediction uh, in the probabilistic manner, and this is a very scalable uh, algorithm. Um, before I introduce the step two for element-wise information acquisition, uh, is there any questions? Yeah, so Cheng, there's, if you look in the Q&A box, I think you can see a couple of questions. So the first one is, uh, what if the size of the input is different regarding the partial VAE? OK, so it's a very good question. Uh, I think that's exactly the, the key you know, the, the point in that architecture. Because if you think about, if you just sum all the elements together, it doesn't matter the input size. If you have some three number together or some five number together, it will always uh, lead to the same one number, right? So the exactly this symmetric operator designed in this way can take a set, in, uh, set input. So the size uh, can be arbitrary size. OK, OK, makes sense. And then for the second question, how does partial VAE compare to traditional missing value imputation methods, such as common filters or general state space models? Um, I think like a, uh, I think these are uh, 
I will separate it as two uh, questions. First, how it's uh, uh, compared to traditional missing value imputation method. So first, the traditional method have a lot. I mean, uh, mean imputation, zero imputation. They are also imputation methods, but they, are, uh, they really don't take the data structure into account. So commonly, for applications, these performance are not uh, as desired. Of course, then we have like more advanced machine learning methods for missing value imputation. I think standard baseline, including like a mice on Miss Forest, or like, for example, matrix factorization based uh, method. So you can think about like this is a nonlinear version uh, of such like a matrix factorization based method. So it's more flexible. So we do compare in the paper with more traditional matrix factorization based method. Uh, we do have better performance. And another advantage is, I think, uh, for traditional missing value imputation with probability method. I mean, they commonly use traditional inference method, uh, then that's not very scalable. For this setting, due to we utilize the uh, amortized inference, which is this VE structure, it's very scalable. So it's very fast because think about our goal. Like we actually want to do this missing value imputation at every active learning step. So we don't want user to wait. So this is another advantage is the, the computation efficiency. So that's one part, how it compared to traditional one, what I think is the traditional one, but you do mention another thing is like, how about state space models, right? So that's another question. I, I will answer it in the second part is, uh, uh, I'm not dealing with time series currently. We're thinking about it's a static vector. Um, and then state space model, you can do missing value imputation. Uh, it's more over time. We actually have uh, follow up work and it's probably will be on archive very soon is we actually combine our uh, variational autoencoder, this partial VAE with Karman filter. So we have, a, we call it a Karman partial VAE. That is more comparable to the traditional uh, state space model. But in the same setting, like in the same explanation, it brings more nonlinearity into account. Does this answer the question? Oh, the, is there more questions? Uh, yeah, there's a third question that just came in. Uh, so the question is just wondering how partial VAE would work with discrete values, like in the Alice and Bob running example. Um, so for because uh, for variation autoencoder, you actually just uh, use the corresponding likelihood. So if your your question is like a temperature, that's a continuous value, and if you are asking about, uh, I mean. Uh, for example, a recommender system, it's a, a like or dislike, uh, then that's binary, right? And it can also be five stars and that's all the no ratings. You just need to use a, a corresponding likelihood in the decoding. So in the elbow, the likelihood you have the px given z, you just choose the, the corresponding likelihood form, then that's fine. Okay, okay. All right, sounds good. I think that's all the questions we have for now. So okay, we can great. continue. Okay, great. And now I think, I assume everyone is clear. Now we're happy. We have a, a method that is partial VAE. We can predict the missing value in a probabilistic manner and very flexible. And then the next step, uh, what we want to behave like Bob is choosing which question to ask. So which feature to acquire. So that's uh, active element-wise information acquisition and it is in a personalized manner. So what do we need to do here? So you can think about, we, we have an agent, so then we have a user. What we want to choose is there's a lot of question and I need to decide which question I should ask. And in this way, I want to ask a question which I think will give me the best information gain, like will be most informative for my decision. So that's the problem formulation. So it's we want to choose a question ID I that uh, is argmax of uh, information reward R given the current XO. So XO is like given current, like seeing all Alice is coughing, uh, condition around this, what is the uh, best question I should ask next? So this is a problem formulation. And next is how do we define the information reward? So this is where the Bayesian experiment design come into place. So we actually borrow from the Bayesian experiment design and use the form of Lindley information. Uh, so this is to define uh, how we define this information we are is the KL divergence between these two terms. So you can see the red one is uh, the X5 is our target, let's say, whether to take Alice to hospital or not. So XO is what we already observed, uh, like uh, in the Alice case, it's coughing. X5 is a decision like a hospital to go to hospital, how stay at home. 
And then we want to choose xi. So we can think about the decision for taking care of Alice with xi or without xi. How does it make the biggest difference? Right, so the KL divergence measures the, the difference between these two. So we want to find the xi and measure how much difference by observing this particular question will make for our decision. So this uh, is the, the traditional, it's also the, the definition of linked information that's back to like 30 years ago. But what's special here is we need to compute the expectation because before we ask a question, we don't know what's the answer, right? So here, every end of this term is intractable because so we also don't know the final decision, right? Because what we know is only the Alice coffin. So what all this term, how to sample xi, how to predict x phi, these are all from our partial AE because that's a probabilistic model that can give xo and then predict what's all the as an unobserved arrival. So you can treat x phi just as a, uh, some special dimension. There was a whole partial AE I talked about. So this is intractable because to compute this for that model, we need to marginalize the D. And for each phi is conditional on xi, x phi is conditional on xi. So this is extremely expensive to compute. So we actually propose a very efficient approximation. I will not go into all the derivations here. You can have a look at our paper, but the, the general idea is we can use the trained rule of KL instead of doing the computation in the x space where the x phi and x i are involved, we can convert it to the, the z space in the latent space so that we can break it down into two KL terms that is on z space and we can share a same set of examples of x i and x phi and we only need to sample it one time. So that's the, uh, the general idea of how we approximate this term so it is uh, efficient and uh, we can do it in time. So let's look at an example of how the whole system can work because now we have this objective. So we can think about, uh, if you're familiar with Boston housing, the, the, the scenario is like this. So we can think about Kim is a customer and Ty is a broker and Kim wants to buy her dream house. And each time uh, Kim probably, Kim need to decide how much she want to pay for this house. And if you can call her broker Ty to ask a question and each time uh, she asks a question, Ty need to do some work and come back with answer. Of course, then each answer, then each of this round, like a question and answer round is cost in terms of time. And of course, also probably in terms of money. I'll show you a demo how our method works in this case. So a demo you will see will uh, look like this. So on the left part, I'll show you our solution. On the right part is the baseline, means you can just ask a question in a random order. So as this is a demo, we actually, uh, the answer will be a test value, so we know what's the target value. So here is the ground truth for the example. And here is a model prediction of the phi, uh, that is a px phi. So that is based on the current observation. And here is the list of questions we could ask. So there are like uh, the number of teachers around the region or something like that. And the bars actually is the information reward I talked about the R. So it's kind of tells you uh, how informative that is to ask this question. And the upper here is the question we answered and these are all the candidates to ask. So here is the demo. So you can see that we'll drag our solution on the left hand side and then we'll drag uh, the baseline solution on the right hand side. You see the whole list of questions we can ask and the corresponding uh, information of this question. And you can see uh, here we drag the target value and then the current prediction. And this is after answering just the, the first question. Then this is the input. Uh, you see on the left it is as like the index of highways. On the right it's the width of distance. And then after answering this question, you see we update the inf information reward. All these bar lengths change, right? Because if you input uh, an answer, 
and then all other questions will carry less information compared to the question haven't been asked before. And then you can see that on the left, our method after asking two questions, we're already much closer to the target uh, prediction, and on the right is much further. You can see this is after three questions, and we're very close. So you see our goal is we can choose the correct ask question to ask, and then we can get to our high decent quality as fast as possible. I'll stop here. So you can see that uh, here in this demo, I show a list of questions of like from a simple broker setting to buy a house. So the same can be applied. This can be a list of questions from a survey, and it can be a list of technical questions from an interview for recruiting, and it can also be a list of medical tests for diagnosis. And we tested on some machine learning benchmark. So here are some examples on some UCI data sets like Boston Housing, Energy, and Wine. The purple and the black are the two uh, different versions of our method. So the black one is our full method that is personalized because we can ask a uh, different question for different user. And if we, instead of taking personalized manner, assume if you're in an education setting, you have access to your whole class, you want to ask the same question, but we take actually the mean of all the tests. Question, that's the purple line, which we call it uh, a single order because we don't do the personalization. And the green one is if we access question in a random order. And the x axis shows the step, like how many questions we ask, like how many features we actually acquired at the current stage. And the y shows the error. So the lower the better. So you can see across all these applications. So with optimized algorithm like uh, ours, so we can optimize which question to ask next. And then with uh, this like a smallest step, we can already get very low error rate. And like if we have a target, for example, for example, a certain RMSE, so we can use the minimum cost. And then at any cost, if we have a fixed cost, so given a cost budget, we can also get the best performance on decision quality. So we also tested a little bit more on more real world examples. For example, Mimic Three. This is a medical data set. I think this is the largest public available medical data set from two real world hospitals. And the task here is risk assessment, which is to predict whether the patient survives or not. And there are 17 physiology variables. So you can see that actually with three variables, we can already predict as good as using all 17 variables. We also tested on the enhance data, that's National Health and Nutrition Survey. There is a US government webpage. We actually download the data from there and they actually drive a truck uh, every year to visit a different place uh, and have questionnaire and they also have different tests like blood tests, uh, et cetera. So here we construct the scenario as asking question to predict the uh, kind of uh, lab exams. And you can also see that we can kind of achieve the best performance already with 200 questions instead of using around 700 questions. So here is the work of Adi. Uh, here is a brief summary. So we propose a novel efficient information acquisition framework. And there are two parts. The first part is missing value prediction with partial variation autoencoder. And the second part is element-wise information acquisition. So what we achieve is with minimum cost, like a, with minimum number of amount of feature we need to acquire in a personalized manner, we can gain the maximum knowledge or in machine learning sense have the lowest error. Um, at this time, is there any questions? I don't see any questions right now. Uh, if the audience has any, be sure to enter them now. But, but uh, as we're waiting, I just have uh, maybe one question for you. Mm -hmm. So how does the, the element-wise uh, acquisition inference method, how does that scale uh, with the size of the data? I mean, it's variation autoencoder, it scales with n because it's deep learning, so that n does not matter. So it is the computation more critical for the number of questions you have. So it's more the, the dimension. Uh, so that uh, is, we can run, like you can see, we have experiments with 700 questions that still in a more like a kind of in-time manner, so that's fine. Okay. okay. Yeah, so okay. then I'll go to next part of work if there's no extra questions or we can discuss in the end of the talk. Okay, so 
yeah, we're very happy with our work. And then we actually uh, went to some real world customer and we actually tested on some real world data set. Uh, and expectation and reality actually differs quite a lot. So I actually expected this beautiful curve with this uh, minimum cost with like high decision quality, but we did not achieve as good as we predicted. So what's the problem there? So the, the thing is, VE is very successful. I mean, partially of VE in general, this type of model are typically applied in data set with simulated statistical type. For recommender system, it's all discrete. For like amnesty data set, it's all continuous. Or like for education, it's also commonly multiple choice question. It's all categorical as well. And they also have similar marginal distribution. Of course, they are not identical, but similar. It's not too crazy. But what real world data set is, the real da world data set comes with different statistical type. So uh, I just have the example of a header here. Uh, it can be age, which is uh, ordinal. Gender, commonly, is categorical with very few category. And county, this can be hundreds because it's still categorical. And there are other variables like body temperature. These are continuous. So these have different statistical type. That corresponding to, for the likelihood for our decoder, it all have different forms as well. Whether we use Gaussian or Bernoulli, it also have different form. And then even with the same type of data, let's say categorical, it have very different marginal properties. And think about a gender, let's say like a, uh, that's very few category and probably not uniformly distributed. And that's commonly within one hand countable, that's very few. And county, these are large volume, uh, like a commonly just a data set that can have hundreds level and they can be very sparse and like if you you live in New York or if you live somewhere far west I think then the, it's very very different the distribution is very heterogeneous and so with this different type and different marginal properties we actually perform very bad so this is not only to the partial variation autoencoder I talked about, but only just the use variation autoencoder. So uh, this is a figure I show. This is a I, I, for visualization. We only take three variables from a much bigger data set. This is from the bank data sets, uh, which have I think original 27 variables. Here we only take three out of it. So you can see it have uh, the first. Uh, dimension. First, the feature is actually continuous with the diagonal. Um, these are uh, pair plots. The diagonal has a marginal distribution and these are the pair plots. And you can see, like, just look at the marginal. The first variable is kind of uh, uh, continuous, but like distributed in a very heterogeneous way. And the second is categorical and the third is also continuous. And then you can see this is a ground truth, which is a kind of visualize the training data set through the pair plots. And this is the generated data from a variation autoencoder. You can see that we don't even able to capture the marginal distribution. The shape is very, very different. We cannot capture such heterogeneous data distribution. And the likelihood is like kind of all different dimensions have a different form. They're not even in the same range. So V is actually really bad on heterogeneous mixed type of data. So to enable what I talk about, like the whole edit framework on such data, because we really want it to work in real life applications, we propose a method called VAEM. It's a deep uh, generative model for heterogeneous mixed type of data. So the M here means mixed type. So this is a very simple model. It's a two stage model. Uh, I mean, the idea is extremely simple. The first stage is marginal VAE, because think about each dimension, it is heterogeneous. Uh, we just uh, use a a separate VAE for each dimension and map it to latent space Z. And because we have commonly a Gaussian prior and the latent space Z, it's much more homogeneous. So each dimension where known the feature for per dimension will fit a separate VAE. So uh, this is up to your choice. In the paper, we actually do one dimension per one VAE per dimension, but you can also group the data together. For example, you can fit one VAE for each type or one day for features that share a certain uh, similarity as their statistical property. And then in this way, this is a marginal way, then you can think it as a way of 
normalization of the data uh, instead of like, for example, we make it a standardized to between zero and one, which you can easily do with only continuous data. Like you can think about you mix the type of data, you don't find such a way. So the way we're doing is let's just use the VE to map it to a latent space as a standardization. And the second stage is the dependence network because for the first stage we normalize it, but we don't know the dependence relationship between all the different features. So we actually use an additional VAE, uh, which learns the relationship between our different dimensions. Uh, and so this is a final network uh, structure. So you can look at it here. This is a final, network, final structure. So it's a two stage method. The first stage is uh, a latent variable model, like VAE per dimension, D is a dimension. And the second stage is you can think of outside as a regular VAE, but instead of on X directly, it is actually the dependence is built on the latent variable Z. And this is how uh, the final model looks like. So we have the marginal decoders. So it is per dimension, each latent variable Z map to each latent variable X. And then we have the dependence network. You can just think of it as a second stage VAE, and that is for a latent variable that map to all the kind of representation of the X and the final prior on H. So commonly we use a standard Gaussian prior. So this is a very simple model. And then uh, what if we have missing data because we want to use a VAEM for the ID framework. So think about the marginal VAE, we're doing it per dimension. So nothing needs to be changed because uh, we just per dimension, uh, there's no missing data problem anymore if you only add one dimension. And for the dependence network, it's uh, the same problem as we were facing before. So what we use is the same technique as before. So we just use a partial encoder like this point net setting for the second stage dependence network. So here we're using kind of the observed part of X and the corresponding to the observed part of Z to infer the second stage latent variable. Um, and then we can impute the missing data with the VIEM. So in some way you can think about in this way to example of missing data. So we can use the observed X and then we can map to this corresponding code of the X. And then with this code X and the original X, we can infer the latent variable H. So that's the second stage VAE. And then with this H, we can sample the unobserved the, uh, that U, so the, the representation of corresponding unobserved dimension, and then we can use the marginal decoder to sample X again. again. So in this way, let's just look at data generation um, quality. So this is without missing data, and uh, we already see the left and far right plot where the ground truth and the AE, and then in the middle is our VAEM. You can see that with our VAEM, we can actually generate data that looks similar to the ground truth data that is desired and they really don't capture the data structure. So we also tested um, the data generation quality in terms of uh, log likelihood. So on the left table is when the data is fully observed and the right side is when the data is partially observed. So it's the same as the first step of Eddie. So we can see that the um, does able to fit the data much better. So these are across different UCI data sets and also with Mimic. So we can use the VAEM combined with objective function, the idea as I proposed, uh, to for the element-wise information acquisition. This is a similar plot as I showed before. These are the steps, this is error, and the same objective is used. So it's the same objective. We want to choose the best feature to acquire and to predict the target. And the red curve is ours, and then all other lines are a different variation of VAE. So the blue one is standard, I mean, it's actually partial VAE, so the standard partial VAE. And then because there are different uh, kind of uh, technique you can you can try for this way, because for example, there are people tried because the likelihood are, are not in the same form, we probably want to balance the likelihood with uh, some different reweighting parameter and just to make them to the same range. So these are different VAE variation that have heuristics uh, to make them better. But you can see that all this heuristic does not work when the data is heterogeneous. And you can see that we work much better and we can behave as desired again. 
So this is a quick summary of the VEM. So in general, we propose a VEM model. So that is a novel variational hot encoder based method that can handle mixed type of data with heterogeneous and marginal and missing values. And we have this two stage training procedure to obtain homogeneous data representation. And we have shown that the EM can outperform baselines both in standard task and modeling data itself, but we also show it in the task of active information acquisition uh, in this sequential uh, decision making task, the same task as Addy, and the EM perform much better than the baseline. I have one small work just to want to quickly go through, but before I jump to next work, uh, is there any questions? Uh, I have a question for you while we're waiting for other questions from the audience. <clears throat> so is there something um, like fundamental about why the VA is unable to perform as poorly for capturing properties of heterogeneous data? So for example, is it because there is no coherent latent space to embed like heterogeneous data types in? So I mean, if you use standard VAE, it's Z equal to X different dimensions. And for different dimensions, so it's factorized for x1, uh, p, uh, x1 given z, p, x2 given z, right? So you all factorize in this way. And if it's different type, the likelihood of form will be different. It's like if you think about Gaussian, that's the, the range, it can completely different range than a binary, right? So then it can pay attention to just one dimension and ignore all other dimensions because a particular dimension is just so dominant for a subset of dimension. I see, I see, okay, makes sense. And then with VAM, for example, because we all map it to latent uh, space already, then the second state VAE always use a Gaussian likelihood for when you decode from H to Z, which is already the latent representation of X. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. I'll then go quickly to the last uh, small piece of work. I'll just go very briefly due to the time limitation. Happy to take questions in the end. So while we're like kind of working on the ID framework, we're also talking with many real world customers, as you, you see before. So the mixed type of data is not only a problem we, we encountered, because the a typical conversation I have is like, wow, this is so cool. And then I said, oh, let's try it. Do you have data so that we can start with it? Then the customers say, we don't have any data yet, but we can collect. And so in this way, we propose the icebreaker. So we want Addy to work in the situation that there is actually no data or very few data available. Because Addy actually is a framework that we train a partial value. So we assume there is already training data. It is this personalized information acquisition for, like from zero information for the test set. It's only one new customer or new patient come that would do the sequential information acquisition. So the icebreaker, what we want to do is we assume there is no training data. There is pool data. You can think about in the hospital setting. So there is no data collected, but there may be patients in the hospital. You can decide whether you collect some data to train your model. So what you want to do is collect the data that are super efficient to train your model as fast as possible. And then you can switch to that, the objective. So in the uh, icebreaker work, we actually propose also two parts. One is a deep generative model. We call it PA Belgam. And then the objective that is actually to collect the training data. So in particular, because to collect the training data in this way, we want to collect the data that can reduce the model uncertainty. So it's the epistemic uncertainty, and we need explicitly measuring the epistemic uncertainty of the model. So instead of a standard version autoencoder, where all the parameter knows the neural network, it was the point estimate, it was the one number, we made it to our distributions. So then that can quantify how uncertain is the model itself. So you can think about in the graphic model setting, like uh, the left is partial version of the and the right is the new model. So instead of the theta as just a, a number outside the hit point estimate, and we actually treat the theta as a distribution as well. So the theta itself becomes a stochastic variable. So of course the model factorizing this way, you need to consider theta as part of your model. It's not a parameter anymore, and you need to estimate itself uh, as it's a distribution. So for the icebreaker, it's really important for us to get the correct uncertainty estimate of the theta because this is a global variable and that is so crucial for our objective. We actually propose a new hybrid inference algorithm as well. Uh, so we actually use amortized inference 
for the local latent variable Z here. And we use stochastic gradient MCMC for the global latent variable theta. Because to make the model scalable, what is the expensive part is Z because it's a scale with the number of data. We keep this deep learning framework this is scalable. And then as the theta is already global variable, it does not uh, like uh, replicate with the number of data anyway. And this is crucial to get the uncertain estimation correct. So we use SGMCMC as we iterate between one inference step and with one sampling step. So the computation cost, the computation efficiency actually the same with a standard uh, partial variation autoencoder. You can see that the full Bayesian version of the partial AE, we call it um, partial amortized Bayesian deep latent Gaussian model. So for the icebreaker, we need a slightly different objective because we actually want to use the objective to make the model more uncertain to reduce epistemic uncertainty. In the, in, the, in the imputing setting, there is supervised and unsupervised setting because for the imputing setting, for example, recommender system, we can directly do entropy reduction on the model parameter theta. And for the prediction setting, we actually want to both reduce the epidemic uncertainty and also learn to predict. So then we use the second objective. So we can use the PA Balgam in Eddy directly, and also we can use it for training data collection. So here we show, like on movie labs, like the first uh, setting, uh, how we collect the training data, and we can see the training negative log likelihood, and this is the number of training data. So we count the number, it's not as rows, but as a single element. So it's actually a very small number of data. So we can see is uh, first, if we compare just without the active learning part, only compare the PVE as I presented earlier, and with this full Bayesian version um, of the Belgium, this is blue one, this is the green one. So with uncertain estimation of the parameter, we can already perform much better with small number of data. Even if it's random collected, you can see there is quite a big gap. And the red curve means we turn on the active information acquisition, and you can see that we're even more efficient. And here is a bar plot of like a different number of features uh, picked. So this is one feature can be picked like a uh, hundred times, and this is some feature just a, uh, oh, okay, this is normalized. So do pick much later. So you can see if we pick randomly, it's concentrated, it's all very close to the expected number per, like per feature, how many not time it can be picked. And you can see that use icebreaker, we actually have a long tail distribution because you think it as a matrix, you have user and the, and the feature. You both want to learn the, the relationship between different features, but you also want to learn the statistic of the, the user. So that means you, for some roles, you'll pick a lot of feature, and for some roles, you don't. And then for users, you actually want to expand a lot as well. So with a fixed budget, we actually explore both column-wise and row-wise so that we can obtain the best performance with minimum number of data collected. So the same we can observe with mimic data. It's the same setting you can see. Uh, and also we added uh, another, this light blue curve is standard uh, active learning, which means you only pick a column, but then you, you only consider costs for the, for the label. So that is column-wise picking. So that is not as efficient as element-wise picking. So the same conclusion here, uh, the full Bayesian version is much better than the not full Bayesian version and compared to the standard active learning, which is bold objective, and our method is the most efficient one. And we can actually see this is accumulated uh, number of uh, data uh, for each feature. And it means like this as a data set size and this as a number of features from all these different features for mimic, it means Glasgow uh, score, like I response and all this. Uh, so the Glasgow scores are very important from medical setting. You can see that we pick this very frequently, but we want to see that it's actually like have a nonlinear behavior. And the glutose, it is a very important feature, but it is not as easy to learn or informative as, for example, I response, because if the I don't response means uh, the, the patient passed away. So we can see in different training stage in the model, we actually learn to pick different features in different frequency so that it kind of demonstrate a quite sophisticated strategy that any heuristic cannot really replace. So we can see that the both Bayesian treatment of the weight and active learning can really help significantly on the efficient training as well. 
So a quick summary of icebreaker. So we propose icebreaker to address the ice start problem where there's no or very few training data available. There's costs associated with each information acquisition as well. And so uh, we want to be cost efficient. And then with icebreaker combined with Eddy, it means we can deploy this model at the beginning. And technically we propose a the PA Belgum, so that's kind of a full Bayesian version of the partial AE. And also we have the new inference algorithm that is the hybrid inference algorithm. We have the new objective function and we do demonstrate like a very promising experiment result for real world data sets. And so here is the last slide. I listed the three work I talked here. So the first is Eddie, published in ICML last year. So the VEM is the new work, is currently on archive. And the icebreaker we published this in your IPS last year. And so please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thanks, Jane, for a great talk. So while we're waiting for questions, and as a reminder, be sure to enter your questions in the QA box. I'll start with a question of my own. So for for Belgum, uh, how do you handle discrete variables? Um, uh, you mean this, uh, like uh, the same question, like if the Belgum can, can be used in that way? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same. So the only difference is we treat the neural network parameter as stochastic variable. So for the likelihood from uh, X condition on Z and the theta, it still depends on your variable type you use corresponding likelihood. But the key here is, I mean, you can think about this like combining Bayesian neural network and VAE together, <laughs> like as well Z to X, it's like kind of Bayesian neural network, but different from Bayesian neural network, Z is actually a latent variable. And for, uh, yeah, for VAE, so like you can think about that we have this full Bayesian treatment of the weights. Uh, all other steps, like uh, how, I mean, we can combine this with the VEM as well, change the different structures. It's the only thing we do is change the treatment of the theta for the parameter. Okay. And then a second question from my end as well. How, so Belgium is, it's, you're kind of working to some extent, right, in a exploration exploitation setting. Yeah. So have you thought about evaluating the model on uh, like, reinforcement learning tasks, for example? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good question. First is, I think there are two parts of it, right? So first part is whether such type of model can be used in reinforcement learning setting. And the second part is whether to solve the same same kind of problem, this sequential decision making, instead of using this all basic experiment design exploration and all this objective, whether we just use it in reinforcement or to learn a policy. So for the first part, so we do explore a little bit on combining this model with reinforcement learning, but commonly it is more instead combining this model, but it's more the, when I talk about this uh, karma and partial of AE, or we actually use part of AE with direct LCM uh, with reinforcement learning framework, it does help. So this is also work to come. And then the second is, whether we, for the sequential decision making, we can also just use reinforcement learning. First, I will point out there are two related work. One is also published in your EPS last, last year uh, by Shem et al. They, they use reinforcement learning for exactly the same task, but they are not as example efficient. And secondly, we do actually have a workshop paper that uh, instead of using patient experiment design, we use our model like the VAE model and then uh, also combine it with classifier with point net in the reinforcement learning setting. And uh, this is published in the workshop that's called Uden, and I think also published last year. So the difference is reinforcement learning can achieve better performance because uh, for the current Bayesian experiment design, it's, uh, it's greedy. And so we want probably reinforcement learning can be non-myopic so that it can find a global best order. So in the best case, reinforcement learning can perform better than our current baseline, but the drawback is example efficient. So reinforcement learning cannot be as example efficient. Meanwhile, for our current re uh, research, we're also exploring non-myopic Bayesian experiment design because you need to consi consider, okay, we want to do case step in total and we mar need to marginalize the, uh, and the, the probability for each step considering how many steps we want to do. Okay, okay, cool, thank you. And then we have a question now from the audience, if you look in the Q&A box. So in the VAEM, um, just trying to get some intuition on how the data 
point specific latent variables H relate to the feature specific marginal latent variables Z. Um, Do you see that question? Let me see. Do you guys want to know how the data points to? Uh, okay, so uh, this is a picture. So you can think about completely separately. So the Z is only a representation of original feature. It's one feature for one data point will correspond to a Z, like one number, like in the big matrix, so each number of X, you can actually translate it to a Z. And then you kind of, you can, the most intuitive way to think about it is you have a big table and each column can be different type. Then you first use marginal V, you translate it to another table, replacing the original number and then to a Z. And then you just fit a standard partial V on this new table. And then uh, I think that's an intuitive way to think about it. And H actually is a, way, a partial way that relates all different dimensions. And then the, the Z and X is like, you can think about the marginal decoder is kind of just a mapping from the new represented table, like pre-processed table to the original uh, data space. Okay. And then we have a second question here. Can these models scale to do active training example selection for optimization of some classical task, such as image classification or speech recognition? Uh, so that depends on the setting. So like uh, in some way you can think about our objective is your generalization of bold, which is standard active learning activation function. I mean, in the icebreaker, we do compare with bold. Uh, where is this? Uh, kind of the light blue line. So it depends on the setting. So for image classification, uh, I commonly assume the, the in this problem setting, the full image is uh, observed. You are just uh, trying to, to get the, the label, right? So then uh, it is, you can still use our method, but it would kind of map to a particular setting of active learning. And what I think our method is most uh, kind of special about is more where you think about if your, if your image, each, each pixel is associated with cost. That is where our method is, have the strengths because the standard active learning, they don't consider, okay, for the whole vector of X, each element have cost, and they just consider, like in some way for a table, they only consider rows. And for here, we consider elements. So that's how it's mapped to. So we can translate it to it, but it will be a special scenario kind of map to a little bit of traditional active learning. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. I think that is all the questions we have. So we can leave it there. Thank you, everyone, for some great questions. And thank you, Chang, for a great talk. Uh, very interesting work. And for everyone who's available in late August, we'll see you again in about a month or so on August 26 for Andrew Gelman's talk. All right, thank you again. Bye-bye.